Hello and welcome to the Ramon Foster Show, brought to you by the Get-Go Cafe and Market. He's Ramon in Hendersonville, Tennessee. I'm Dan Kovacevic in downtown Pittsburgh. And Moan, let's talk about the script that we've put together for this show. What, <laughs> are we going to follow the script today? You know Is that what? what we're doing? I wish we did have a real script because if I can tell we you about don't. the script. By the way, everyone needs to know, <laughs> what, did we not script anything on this no, show? Oh, y'all get this show as raw as it actually comes out of our mouths with knowledge. Okay, we do have to say that because I didn't have in my script that DK was going to be chugging the liquids on the show. That right there. I got a week in California coming up on a hockey trip. And they don't have yeah. this particular product out from the West Coast. So <laughs> I'm getting my fill now. Some people would actually call you spoiled the fact that you go to California in the wintertime. So do you really want to be telling everybody the script, DK? Uh, I'm not one of those people. These are the, these these are not my favorite places on the planet. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, the script, man. Big script. topic of conversation this weekend. And it's crazy, but it is. It is so it derived from if you didn't see it, Arian Foster on his uh on his podcast, one of my former college teammates. I'm actually in a group chat with the guy right now. Okay, uh, <laughs> we say we're we're cousins because we have the same last name. Black guy's last name Foster. I mean, it's got to be some connection there, right? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Legitimately, it's got to be something. But he has a podcast that he does, and on there, somebody asked him a question. It's like, hey, man. You want to admit like the NFL is scripted, and you know, didn't they give you that sheet of paper for you guys to study it? And he went on and on and on. on. Didn't he broke character just a little bit? But broke character going <laughs> about how like in practice, all practice was was us reading through the script and rehearsing what the oh NFL my God. had written for us. DK, hear me out. We just did a show yesterday talking about the best sport in America and how big it is and how you can't plan it and it's super competitive. Do you really think the writers of the NFL are that daggone good? <laughs> I'm more interested in whatever Arian Foster's motivation was because I got to tell you, yeah. it's been a long time since the name Arian Foster rolled off the tongue of the collective football public. I mean, he was – for anybody who's even wondering who this yeah. is, he was a very good running yeah. back for the Houston Texans for a while there. And uh, he made headlines all over, especially in a social media kind of way. Oh, no doubt. Because no, everyone's no coming in. The people who just who are mad at the refs from the last game in which they were mad at the refs, which is almost all of them love to come in and say, oh, yeah, they just wanted New England to get in or they wanted to whatever. Nobody yeah. ever stops to think about this. Moan, the last time we brought this up on the show, we started hearing it in comments. People were like, are you guys that really? Are you really that naive? Do you really <laughs> think? But yet when you challenge them to say, how? Please tell us how. You are going to get, how many officials are on the field? Seven? Ah, uh, seven, I think. Yeah. If you have, If you're going to get them in on it, yeah. you're going to get in. 106 uniformed football players. Yes. You're going to get in all of their various coaches. Oh, and guess who else you have to get into it now? Who? All the replay officials who aren't even in the stadium. <laughs> right? They don't get, yeah. They've I, I, all I, got to be in on it, and they've all got to be on the QT, right? That's, that's practical. DK, you've been around the business for a while, right? You, you've, you've been seen. in the business. I, I know, but I, okay. everybody know, like, they won't believe me not having a script, okay? Like, they probably side Because on me, like, you're a foster? But, no, because <laughs> I'm a part of the cult, uh, the NFL, right? To continue. Oh, okay. I, I'm asking you this question because this is this offseason. We're going to have this conversation. Let's roll with it, right? How stubborn are guys, how egotistical are guys to actually be able to follow a script? That's where the buck ends right there. How how stubborn and egotistical are guys? What do you mean by that? Oh, you're talking about in terms of pride? You're talking no, no, about in, in terms, in terms of, of actually following a actual script to oh, where they get no catches no. or they make no. no tackles. They get cut or they get I mean, injured. Look, look. I could be that guy who ends this segment on a really morose note in about 
2.5 seconds by bringing up serious injuries that have occurred in the NFL. Okay. Yeah. And that's not where anybody wants this segment to go. So I'll play along. Okay. (laughs) I'll play along. Okay. That because there are people who are that myopic when it comes to following their own team that when they see the referee throwing several flags in a row and they'll end up going against their team, they think it's happening to the Steelers. When in fact, a bad officiating crew is just a bad officiating crew. Okay, it doesn't matter which team. They're not out there thinking to themselves, I'm going to hose the Steelers. Why would they? What would be the interest and who would be the organizer and who'd be following along en masse? Oh, listen to me. In my 11 years, had I read a script that said I'd only get to a Super Bowl in year two and (laughs) never go back. And as good of teams as we've had, I recently had somebody tell me like, man, the teams that y'all had, y'all won a lot of games. You know what I said? Other than my marriage ring, I have no ring to show for it. Hey, oh, no. the losing ring that we get wasn't even a ring. Jeez. It was a freaking watch. We got a watch, DK. You had, like, not even anything to put on your hand. I actually saw a guy uh, recently who had, like, two, uh, like, loser rings. Just guess is what we'll call it now, right? And I'm thinking to myself, dang, we couldn't even get that. I may have actually, sp- you know, sported that a little bit. Can't even do it because there was no script and I – Guys would have broke character too much to actually have See, that. you're taking the script thing like to the pro wrestling extreme, which I know is what, what Arian Foster did. Well, well, that happens, though, in wrestling. I'm right? actually at least attempting to entertain the part that might be seen as feasible by a sane human being yeah. or semi-sane, which is that the officials would have it out for your team. But, but, but even then, and that's it. The NFL wants – that's another one that comes up. The NFL wants – a matchup between player X and player oh. Y, and they're going to do how? Oh. How? How? Roger's getting in on the headset, and he calls in, and he says, hey, you, line judge, flag now. What do you think is happening? Do you not think that this line judge, the moment that he's out of the line judging yeah. business, isn't going to run to TMZ and say, you'll never, you'll never believe what Roger asked me to do? And from my understanding, TMZ pays well for that and type of stuff, too. they pay better than Roger pays his refs, okay? <laughs> and, and, yes. No no doubt about it, man. I will say this. There are components of it where a quarterback gets a call that another one gets. A team is known for certain things, then they get a flag for that type of stuff. Yes. A coach is a hothead in certain situations, and the ref, the crew before them heard about that type of stuff. I, there is a portion of the game, but that's at every level, though, DK. That's not just the NFL. That's not just football. All it's sports human nature. It's Jordan also under, mm-hmm. it's understanding the game. You know, Kevin yeah. Dotson from the Steelers uh, told me at one point, this was late in the season, uh, he, you know, he had a stretch there where he and Dan Moore, remember, were ha- picking yeah. up a bunch of bunch of penalties, right? Yeah. And I, I, I talked with both of them about this individually, but in the in Dodson's case, he said, "Listen, I committed a certain infraction early in the game, and that guy never took his eyes off me after that." Now I'm sure you've experienced that, Moan, oh, because it's a, yeah. okay, that position. Uh, like those, guys, they're all that's all they're watching for is holding. Okay. Yep. And once they see you hold once, they figure you're doing it all the time, and they yeah. don't want to be the dummies. You know how there's that's that line. There's holding on every play in the NFL. There's holding yeah. on every play, yeah. and there probably is to some degree. Yes. Yeah. So they think, all right, well, this guy held once. He's going to be holding the whole game. Or, 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 or this is the other thing, too. Coaches politic for certain calls because they've seen stuff on film, too. Yeah. And, and, and the ref crews actually uh, watch film, too. So they see certain tendencies, what, the way guys get away with stuff. Mm-hmm. And he, they'll let you know, hey, hey, I saw you doing this. And, you know, pull back a little bit. There's warning shots there. Yeah. Now. Uh, but that's DK, good officiating. That's that good officiating. They tell you in advance, hey, listen, I saw you doing that. You're coming real close to crossing the line. Just don't do it again. Facts. And, that, and doesn't it, that happen all the time? Tell does. tell people this. Yes. It does 100 percent Now let's go to our favor side. There are times in which we played against, let's say, a guy like Vontez Murphy. 
<laughs> you see something happen with him, and they do have a quick trigger, and it works in our it works in our advantage. He's so, actually the example I was going to cite next. Yeah, it's the it's in the eye of who you love more, right? Yeah, it's, it's if you feel a victim or but not. But none of this is scripting. None of no. this is favoriting a certain team or anything like that. You want to see something real quick? Hmm. Want to see a transition? We'll Good. talk about a guy who now will be handing out his own script. When we come back on the Ramon Foster Show. Welcome back to the Ramon Foster Show. Brian Flores is now the defensive coordinator of the Vikings taking that position in Minneapolis. Yeah, and he's about to write the scripts up there for his for his purple people eaters. Or I don't know if they still call them that up there or not. I think but, they're known as that, yeah. Yeah, um, but how big of a loss is this, Moan? And, you know, how much did you have I – mean, obviously you didn't play – he was only with the Steelers for one year, but you got a chance to know him a little bit? I did, man. Um, I met him actually at the Senior Bowl. I never ran across him before. I saw him on the field and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. High respected guy. Uh, and, and let's go back to his case. You don't get jobs in the NFL like this. Again, these type of big jobs if you're not good at what you do. Right? So, Brian Flores getting his job speaks a lot about how good at what he does and did in the NFL, despite what happened in Miami, despite what happened with, you know, the Belichick call, you know, whatever happened from that, he's good at it. Despite the lawsuit, he's good at his job. That's why he's Active lawsuit. Active, active lawsuit. Very yeah. active lawsuit, okay? Um, but I met him at the Senior Bowl, and I actually crossed paths with him the night before I saw him at practice. I was like, God feel like i know that you know you see the faces yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i was like I, I know that face and he was with a scout down there so i didn't really say much because i wasn't too familiar or privy with him you know and i probably should have that night um but i saw him the next day and um coach tomlin introduced me and him together and we had a conversation really cool dude you can tell a no nonsense type of guy you ask the question, what are the Steelers losing? I don't know how much they are losing other than guidance, other than an extra set of eyes, other than the fact that this is where he's at. He stayed in the game. Coaches, players, personnel, unless you're going in and an analyst. Like, when you're in the business, DK, this goes from probably high school, college, NFL. You got to stay in this world. I think that's why you see now so many coaches. Let's use Alabama. Get fired from a job. Where do they go to? Bill O'Brien went to Alabama. Lane Kiffin went to Alabama. These coaches stay in the fold. Brian Flores got let go. Coach Tomlin reached out to him, got him in the fold, and kept him in coaches, kept his name relevant. I recently saw an article that said Byron Leftwich, who's out of a job right now for Tampa, reached out to Notre Dame to say, hey, I'm here. I'm, I'm available. Here. If you mm-hmm. need a guy, I think they just lost their offensive coordinator to Alabama. So you got to stay in that world to actually continue on in that world. And I think that's why Brian Flores and Coach Tomlin came to their agreement. And I don't think the Steelers had to pay him too much because the Miami Dolphins are still paying them too. Um, but you got to stay engaged and sharpened in this coaching world to actually get these type of opportunities and be good. And, and get paid. Let's remember that not everybody has the Flores situation where he was continuing to get paid. Uh, 99% of the the coaches, coordinators who get let go, their paychecks go to zero. Yeah. And so there is a great urgency, (laughs) a a natural and human urgency to want to get employed again. Uh, Moan, we've we've never been afraid to talk about the hard subjects uh, on this show, to say the least. And... I know one thing you and I have agreed upon is that there was one out of 32 NFL teams that was in a position to hire Flores. One. Mm -hmm. There was one one out of 32 uh, because of the Rooney family's reputation, because of the Rooney rule and everything else that went into that, and because Mike Tomlin isn't shy about what he represents in that context as well. And I – I know for a fact that Flores has been, in addition to being grateful for the opportunity and everything else, immensely respectful of Tomlin for the opportunity that he had here. And I want to make this part clear. They didn't even know each other (laughs) before the past year. 
They did. And you had a chance down at the Senior Bowl to interact with the two of them together. How did yeah. that come? How how did they come across in terms of you know how they were? They were together each other. The, the, the entire time. Like the, when right? I was around, yeah, they were. And you Coach know he's wanted, leaving too. He's, yeah. he's leaving. And this is the other part too, where yeah. you stay engaged. I'm sure meetings probably happened in Mobile for Flores, mm-hmm. you know, because he went to other, uh, I think he, he interviewed for a couple other jobs. I'm more than sure the central hub of doing business before owner meetings and the combine, he was there probably meeting with the Vikings because the following week after the uh, – Senior Bowl, he gets higher. But him and Tomlin were, were side by side the times I saw him on the field. Of course, Tomlin wandered off and did his own thing, but they were beside each other in a sense of like the representation, as you said, from Coach Tomlin to Flores and coaches like them was, look, we're in this together. And I think when you talk to most coaches, DK, they'll never talk bad about another coach because they understand how hard and gritty it is to actually survive in the NFL. It's only 32 professional teams. There's 100, I think, 21 college teams. There's opportunities everywhere there. But the prestige of what the NFL is, it was good to see Flores be in a position with a coach that has a lot of respect in this league um, kind of. You, it, be together, be united in that. And I think we see that in a lot of different phases. It ain't just him. We've seen, you know, other coaches. Rex Ryan was notorious for being able to have guys around him. Parcells, you've heard how many times he's been able to reach back to guys. Dungy is one of those guys. Heck, uh, uh, Chucky, gosh, uh, Gruden. Gruden. is one of those guys that you say, yeah, Coughlin, I know was one of those guys. Like, they band together. So it was good to see Tomlin and Flores kind of together, you know, in a sense of like both these dudes are, you know, head coaches, you know, one at one particular time. And the business of the NFL doesn't get in the way of what's good in the league. I thought that was really cool to see. And as far as Flores and his contributions to the Steelers, as you were saying just a little bit ago, Moan, he was more of a a wild card. Like, yeah. like and, and that's the way he was utilized. He arrived late in the process in terms mm-hmm. of, you know, getting set up. With, compared to the rest of the coaching staff. And everything that I've learned from covering the team uh, and, and being around them is that he was – obviously he was responsible for the position that he was yeah, responsible absolutely. for, which is middle, inside linebackers. But he also had his hand in a lot of different things. Uh, when people hear that sometimes, they're not going to know what that means. You <sighs> obviously do. What does it mean whenever Mike Tomlin says, and he does all the time, that we just have all hands are in the pile. Uh, everybody's voice yes. is heard. Uh, he doesn't say, hey, listen, you can't talk about this. You're just the inside linebacker no. coach. But he did, it's not, it has nothing to do with Flores. It has, it's everybody. It's everybody. He One of his other catchphrases inside the building, this one's more inside, is, listen, I don't care what ideas come from. Like, the good ideas come from. That's one of his main. I don't care where good ideas come from. It's always been his MO about winning. You know, like, that's what it's about is, look, if it's going to work for us and help us win, let's do those things. And I think that's where Flores comes into play. You say, well, how involved can he be? Well, maybe he looked at the situation and said, coach, Robert Spillane's probably a little bit better in the run game versus Devin. It'd be better if you let me make this call as an outsider to put Devin on the sideline at first and second down. You know, it's those types of things. Hey, coach, I know you love the fact that Terrell is a big guy that's in the back half of the defense. Bring him up to the line of scrimmage. You know, I'm not saying he made those calls. Flores was a big fan of that sort of thing in general. You see what I'm saying? He he was also the one, from what I understand, uh, who – they never really ended up being able to do this because of injuries, but to go with the three safety formation, you know, See? that we talked about a lot. And that's because DeMonte Casey spent most of the year hurt. But if they'd had three safeties that they would have trusted to be able to pull this off, they would have had something pretty neat there. Oh, no doubt about it. But you, you got to also think this too. There's a lot of credit that was given to Brady and Bill Belichick in New England. Another guy that was that had, you know, is a cog on that will was Flores. He was yeah. a part of that too. So you look at that, you say, well, what did they do? Because it worked really well for them defensively. And he was a part of that also. And then he goes to Miami and let's talk about that seven game win streak that they have. Like that speak a, speaks a lot about uh, what the guy is as a coach. Let's just talk about the coaching side of it with this guru stuff that they throw around. That's some impressive stuff, DK. No question about that. When we come back, 
the only segment that matters. Yes, come on. Welcome back to the Ramon Foster Show. And the only segment that matters, that, of course, is the Hey Moan segment brought to you by the Get-Go Cafe and Market, where three expert chefs fine-tune every sub, burger, salad, wrap, drink, and app so that it's crafted for craveability. Order your favorite entry at the Get-Go Cafe and Market today. Better believe it. In, in lieu of just one Hey yeah. Moan today, we're going to throw in a... a little bit of a, a mix like a, a you know like a mixtape or okay. i went like yeah, this mixtape mix but that's not yeah. tape that's an that's EP. an album that's an yeah. album that's scratching that's the, the the lp yeah yeah uh this is in, in regards to the conversation that we were having yesterday on the show about the international component to the game and expanding and boy did we hear from people on that one including yeah. including international people uh, so we're going to start with the first one here. It's from Matt Hanford over in England. He says, hey, Moan, the UK Steelers fan here. And I'm speaking to friends here who don't follow the NFL and specifically asking why they don't watch it. The number one answer is, one, I don't understand the rules. And two, I don't get why they stop and start all the time. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> yeah. you, you called it out. It's taken maybe a 15 to 20 year investment of persistent drip feeding sports watchers here to embrace your wonderful game. Evan says it should have another bye week after the international game if there was an expansion. That sounds like a pretty good idea, right? It does, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a fun thought that's very likely to become a reality. I'm curious as to how you guys would handle an expansion. And the last one here that I'm going to read is from Richard Galley in Italy who says, uh, living in Italy, I can confirm that 95% of the people here don't understand the game at all, let alone the rules. But the few that watch it and understand it do love it. Um, it's a big world, Moan. You know, it is. it is. But how would you, you know, if you were Roger Goodell and you were just even more powerful than Goodell, you could just wave a magic wand and say, this is how I want it to be. How would you handle it? Wow, that is a great question. Um, you know what? I, I think you have to take the NBA approach. And the, the, the issue is, is the NBA approach is, is the uh, big shoes, big, big shoe company, Nike, um, Adidas, Under Armour has become huge. Now, let's take those three. Those three companies in the NBA – they get their players in the summertime and they send them to different countries and they put basketball courts. They hold basketball camps. They put those guys in front of folks with face value, with understanding of the game and basketball is worldwide. Football, soccer is the exact same way, too, with the way they go about it. It's more accessible. Um, I think they have to take that approach first and foremost, DK, is, look, you got to introduce this one by one to people. like And, and finding – different positions to do it. Maybe, you know, the big shoe companies take their biggest guys and they send them to China. They send them to England. They send them to, you know, Italy. They send them to Germany, these types of places. And they do this more often in the summertime or the, you know, early springtime is that's where you grow the game and introduce it. Honestly, investing football fields. I know, you know, the upkeep is different in a basketball court, but that's where you got to do it. You got to slowly, as you said, break down the rules and understanding. Maybe you start with flag football, you know, and then you build up from there. I think that's the only approach. Basketball has been really good at the uni at the worldwide approach to building their brand, especially the NBA. How were you received as the Steelers ambassador on that 2013 trip to England? Uh, when you went over there, how how did you, how do you did you feel like you were seen as more of an oddity, or do you know what I'm saying? Because you're yeah. here to represent that sport. That's like what what the heck is this? Who's this guy? Do you know what I'm saying? How how was it? I, I, it was exciting for them, more more or less than cool. anything. You okay. can tell just the amateur side of understanding was just you're talking, and the simplest thing that you could do, they were just in awe of, and I was just like. 
you know, I didn't recognize it at the time, but now speaking about it, like the 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 faces of understanding were one of those like, oh, but not like, okay, I get it. It wasn't that one. You know what I'm saying? It was a let me ingest this as best I can to get understanding of the sport. I'm excited that you guys are coming over. That was the response oh, okay. to it more than anything. It I wasn't was, my part of part of their apprehension that I felt on that trip. Uh, it wasn't just Wembley Stadium and that experience, but it was the all the stuff before. Remember, yeah, uh, out in town, and it was just, it would actually blew your mind the number of Steelers fans and Vikings fans who. Oh either, my gosh, it's a still a bar over there. It was it was incredible, but either made the trip, or more accurately, from the people that I talked to, they made the trip from places like Germany and Europe where there were American military bases, and that was the part that was kind of like, yeah, can we just can we just play this game in front of like 60,000 just actual British people? Can we do that? Because that's going to help grow the sport instead of just filling it with Steelers and Vikings fans, which yeah. is a lot of what happened. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, 100%. But it's interesting, too, now that I have an understanding of why there are so many different jerseys in the in the stadium, though, too. Like, you mm-hmm. see Jags all the time because they're always over there, but you see right. Cowboys – during our game and it's simply because when that team came over there they were fans of them and this is the most this is the biggest dose that they're going to get four times a year so they're going to go there and celebrate and dance instead of just watching and consuming it. you will never fully ingrain a sport in any country until there's participation which is why i like that you brought up the field it's not just a matter of taking no. an nfl here's an nfl franchise and we're just going to drop it here in this super big city in europe and it's just going to work like magic no not how it happens no. <laughs> okay they have to know the sport they have to experience the sport they have to feel it yeah you know uh, you have to anticipate what's happening in the action in order to appreciate it me personally, I think you start with designation of fields or at least pouring in some money to it because that's the other aspect of it, mm-hmm. too. You got to pour in some cash so that oh, you're actually yeah. behind it. But I think you introduce it as flag first. Flag that's football. Interesting. That's interesting. And Let the me. NFL is behind that. Yeah, and also you keep people from getting hurt when they don't know what the heck they're doing. That <laughs> part, yes. Flag. Yes. Mom, let's do another one of these tomorrow. I'm with it, DK.